Good morning, and a warm welcome to you on this cold uh, Sunday. We didn't expect snow, but uh, it's here. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome any, everyone to our worship service today. A special welcome to any guests or visitors who might be with us. We'd encourage you, as well as everyone, to sign in on the registration cards found in the pews. We'd also like to welcome those listening in to our videotape ministry, those at Sibley Specialty Care, Hartwood Heights, and Countryview Manor. And then uh, we'd invite you all to stay for a time of uh, coffee and fellowship following the service today. I do have uh, a few announcements to draw your attention to. There is uh, going to be a baptism and a dedication today. And then wanted to remind those in choir, there will be choir practice today after the service. You'll be singing on the 27th. And also there's an usher greeter insert. If you'd like to help out in any way, please sign on that. And then we have two campaigns underway, Cherry's House Bottle Campaign and also Operation Christmas Child. And if you need bottles or the boxes or the containers, they're all out in the fellowship hall. Also, this next Saturday is the Fishes and Loaves, so there's a sign up on the mission table for that. Also, for Mission Fest, we've had a change in speakers we were going to have Sherry, uh, well, Snyderman Cohn was going to come, but because of some family matters, she's not able to make it. We do have a substitute. We have coming for our Mission Fest speaker, Sherry Caston, who is the executive director at the Family Crisis Center. She'll be speaking to us, also to uh, the Sunday school prior. So we will go ahead as planned on October 27th for that. And then I also want to let uh, the men who are involved in the men's Bible study, there'll be no Bible study on Monday night. Uh, I have a nominating committee meeting. I uh, would invite you to take part in the sing-along that starts at 6 o'clock, as well as anyone else who would like to do that. Also, family night out. Um, we're still uh, taking sign-ups for that. If you'd like to take part in that, uh, there's no charge for the meal. It's a free meal. Come and enjoy it. And uh, we'll have, uh, in the sanctuary, we'll be showing a couple videos by Dr. Les and Leslie Parrott on parenting. So uh, please take uh, part in that if you'd like. Also, notice the Heavenly Harvest Table. This is the last official Sunday for that, and all proceeds will go to Upper Des Moines. I do have some prayer chains, some updates on that. One that did not make the bulletin is for Carrie Julius's daughter, Amber Stevens, and her son, uh, Easton, uh, was bit by a dog and a bit near his eye. And uh, they, the eye's going to be okay, but he is in the, in the Sioux Center Hospital, and they're treating it uh, for uh, an infection, and then also he's taking some rabies shots. So pray for Amber, uh, Stevens' uh, son, Easton. Uh, for sympathy prayer concerns, the plant that's up front here is from the Gary Pomerickes uh, funeral that we had here this last week. So keep in your prayers. Uh, his family, uh, Bonnie Pomerickey, who is a sister-in-law, and then the rest of, of her family as well. For prayer chain concerns, another update is for Heather Klein-Walterink's mother, Nancy Masagno. She's from Florida. She had a stroke, and uh, they're hoping to get her be able to walk and talk again. So we want to pray for for her mom, and then also for my mom, Muriel, she went in this week and uh, found out that uh, the pin that was into her ball joint has not moved any further, but because of where it's located, she's going to more than 100% chance of having a lot of pain, so they're going to do a complete hip replacement, and they'll do that on November 5th. The others, uh, I think, are in there that we've had before, so any other joys or concerns? If not, let us stand and greet each other in the name of Jesus Christ.
Good morning. Please join me in a call to worship found in the bulletin. On the cool mountainside and along the dusty roads, the Son of Man called together the people and told them of the love of God. Through parables and acts of kindness, he taught them as one with authority. But his authority was different, for it was the authority of love. Let us, through praise, prayer, and song, worship the God who comes to us as love and grace. Please bow your heads for the opening prayer. O Lord, our God, you are the source of all beauty and goodness. Your grace comes fresh each morning. In each new day, you give us light. May all we do this day praise you for your never-failing love that satisfies our needs and shows us the way to follow. We rejoice in your constant care, for you are faithful in love for all people, offering your salvation through Jesus Christ. Grant us wisdom to see the world around us with your eyes, instead of just seeing our own needs and concerns. Amen. Our opening hymn is Wonderful Grace of Jesus, number 198, and the words on the screen.
Please join me in the unison prayer of confession found in the bulletin. Merciful God, we confess that in attitude and action this week, we have been less than you created and called us to be. We have forgotten your blessing toward us, and in so doing, have failed to be a blessing to others. We have taken for granted the limitless death of your love and forgiveness, and in so doing, we have withheld love and forgiveness from others. In our misguided efforts to maintain control, we have clung to bitterness, hurt, anger, and disappointment, rather than letting go in faith and trust, releasing ourselves to the healing and cleansing power of your spirit. Forgive us, we pray. Forgive us for our willingness to settle for so much less than you desire to give us and to do in us. Help us to see your healing hand in all that we do. Restore us to right relationship with you and with one another for the sake of your Son, our Savior and friend, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners and that he himself died on the, sin, on the cross for our sins so that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, believe in the good news. For in the name of Jesus Christ, we are truly forgiven. Amen. <clears throat> Touch him, 
Thank you, Jessica. At this time, we are going to have a minute for mission from the FOC. Good morning. Mission Fest Sunday will be October 27. Our guest speaker will be Sherry Casting, Executive Director, CEO of Family Crisis Centers in Sioux Center. Over the past three decades, Ms. Casting has led the charge to transform the victim services landscape around the Midwest, as well as challenge the status quo of how others treat victims and survivors of many types of violence. Ms. Casting has developed and implemented the victim services and programs in South Dakota, Nebraska, and Iowa. Most recently, she was honored as a 2019 recipient of the Special Courage Award by the, victim, by the Office of Victims of Crime by the U.S. Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. She's a voice for those who feel they have no voice and encourage them to join the movement to better understand, support, and advocate for victims of domestic and sexual violence, human trafficking, homicide, and any other violent crimes. Ms. Cassian will speak to the seventh grade through adult classes during the 9 a.m. Sunday school into the congregation during the 10 a.m. worship service. Following the service, FOC will be serving a pork loin dinner in the fellowship hall as a free will offering fundraiser for Rocky Mountain High this Rocky Mountain High trip this summer. All are invited and welcome to attend. Our Old Testament reading is 2 Kings 5, verses 1 through 15. Naaman healed the leprosy. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master could see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Abraham replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten, ten sets of clothing. The letter he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? 
can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him with this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a messenger to him to, to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants, Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to go do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you? wash and be cleansed. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all of his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. Our hymn of preparation is, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart, number 515 in your hymnals hymnals and the words on the screen. Jesus came into my heart. I did my soul for which Before I do our gospel reading, I wanted to uh, announce something that I missed in the announcements, a joy. Uh, this is for Bill and Jan Pearson. Uh, they're now grandparents. Uh, Mallory Hertz and uh, the father, Greg, a baby was born yesterday at St. Luke's Hospital in Sioux City. Uh, Kirsten Grace Hertz, she was 5 pounds, 9 ounces, and 17 inches. And Bill called her a little peanut, if you can imagine. Hear now the reading of the Lord's Word as we read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, and then verses 11 through 19. The subtitle to this text is, The Ten Healed of Leprosy. 
Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into the village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And they went and they were cleansed. And then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Now Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Cleansed? Where, where are the other nine? Was there no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to the one before him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. The word of our Lord. Thanks God, God. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray. <clears throat> o Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, the actions of our lives be accepted, O Lord, as you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> it is entirely possible for us to walk through life and never see the hand of God in anything that we are doing. We often don't see it because, well, we're just not looking. What do you see? Well, this past summer on our youth mission trip, we were challenged each day to see the face of God, to see God in the mission work we were doing. Now, for some, that was easy. For others, that was a, a difficult task. It really depended if you were seriously looking for signs of God or not. Now, in the past, I have preached on this text from Luke 17, 11 through 19, and I remember doing it for Thanksgiving because there's an element of giving thanks, as you may have heard. However, today I want to concentrate on the sense of sight that is in this text. For instance, the first instance is done by the ten lepers who see Jesus and they call out to him. Now you might ask, well, why is that such a big deal? Well, any leper that was declared unclean back then must be separated from the rest of society and for fear of contaminating him. That meant they were ostracized from their home, from their families, from their job, from their business. They were supposed to be on the outskirts of the city. And they would have to either wear a bell around their neck that would let people know that they were coming near somebody who had leprosy, or else they were to walk along, and if there were people close by, they were to holler out, unclean, unclean, to make sure nobody would come in contact with them. The other thing they were to do is they were to be a certain distance. The Levitical law called for them to be anywhere from six feet to 150 feet away, depending if the wind was blowing. So if the wind was blowing and it might be blowing towards you with the, the lepers, that you had to stay further away. So let's say these lepers are like 100 feet away. That's about from this distance here to the back of the church. That means those lepers had to be looking for Jesus and trying to see if he was coming. And when they did see him, they called out to him. And uh, perhaps they had heard of Jesus in his earlier ministry of healing uh, just one leper. And so they thought, well, they might as well take a chance and holler out. Jesus, on the other hand, could have simply seen them and ignored their cries for help. Much like we often get hardened uh, to people, and it's not so much around here, but if you're in a large city and there's often people that are, are begging for money or for food, uh, we often get hardened to them. Now, when uh, we were in D.C. Uh, a few, it's about a month ago, uh, with Tom and Denise Kuyper, we had two instances where we ran into someone who was begging for money. The first instance, they came, asked for food, and we kind of ignored them. And that was a lady, and after she went away, we felt guilty. We thought, okay, why didn't we just buy her some food? We had another instance that happened in the Union Station, where there's all kinds of eating places uh, in the lower level there. And uh, another instance, a woman came up to us. She asked uh, if we could help her with uh, buying some food for herself and for uh, her children, who she said were outside. 
Okay, this time we said, okay, we'll go, go buy her some food, and we take her to where she wants to go. She picks out on the menu a $24 meal, which is like the, one of the most expensive. We thought, okay, she's feeding herself and her family. We'll do that. And then I felt like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say a prayer with her while we're waiting. I do that. I get done with the prayer, and she asked me, well, could you give me some money for a bus ticket? And luckily, I had basically used all my cash pretty much in giving and paying for the meal, and so I said, no, I can't do that. Well, we happened to stay in the area because we were waiting for uh, some more, uh, waiting for our next uh, business we were going to do, and so we kind of stuck around, and we ended up seeing that she ate that meal herself, and then she started going around and asking others uh, for more money and to eat as well. So we kind of felt like maybe we were being taken advantage of, but we felt like, well, we saw a need, and we responded to it in kindness, and we left it at that. Now, in much the same way, when Jesus sees these ten lepers crying out, he gives an immediate response. The sense of seeing has more meaning than we realize in this text, and it does because we need to look at what comes before. In Luke 10, 23 through 24, Jesus is blessing his workers. He sends out 72 disciples to go out and heal and to uh, cast out or drive out demons. When they come back, this is what Jesus says. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but they did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Now what makes that even more significant is that what follows that is the story of the Good Samaritan. I think you all know the story of there, but it gives deeper meaning to the words, blessed are they that see what you see. As you see in this picture, there was the priest, there was the Levite, and there was the Samaritan. They all see this injured man in the ditch, but only the Samaritan sees and responds. You see, sometimes we are blind to those who are around us who are hurting, and in our busyness, we often walk by. We don't see a need, we see a distraction. Jesus, seeing the lepers, also sets up what happens later to one of the lepers himself. When Jesus commands, when they came to him, they asked, um, Jesus, Son of God, help us. And he says, go, show yourselves to the priests. Now, what does Jesus do on this? He just speaks. He doesn't touch them. They don't touch him. He doesn't do anything physically to them. He merely speaks, go and show yourselves to the priests. It's only when they have set out on their journey that they are, they are healed and uh, they are made clean. It is their obedience to Christ's command then that is the result of their being cleansed. Therefore, seeing means more to us than just physical sight. It is obedience to God's grace and his mercy that he offers to us. Only the one leper, when he saw that he was healed, came back. And coming back to Jesus is also similar to what happened in our Old Testament story in 2 Kings. Here the mighty warrior Naaman, he also has leprosy. And he's told by God's holy man, Elisha, that he's supposed to go and wash himself seven times in the Jordan. And uh, he questions, Naaman questions the, the, the spiritual power of the Jordan, Jordan water. He says, well, how, how is that water any different or any better in our waters of Damascus, of the rivers of the Abana and the Far Par? And then Naaman finally gives in, as you heard the story. He obeys the uh, prophet's commands, dips himself seven times in the Jordan, and his flesh is restored uh, like that of a young child. Similarly, the leper's obedience in Luke's narrative, the whole point of that is his obedience to the go uh, and show yourself to the priest. But it's only the one leper who saw that he was healed and came back. No doubt the others saw, but they continued on their journey. They were going to the priests. I, I, they were thinking only of themselves. we got to get to the priest. We can't wait to be declared unclean, so we got to hurry. I, they weren't thinking of the event and the miracle that just took place. The one leper sees that he is healed, and he saw the need to go back to Jesus. 
Notice his first response in the text is not to give thanks, but it is to praise God with all of his heart, his, his mind, and his soul. The leper knew that not only was he healed, the hand of God had just been laid on him from a distance. Jesus was not just a prophet. He was only God could heal by merely speaking and having somebody change from having leprosy to being cleansed. He knew that Jesus had the saving power to save his soul as well. And this leper comes before him. He bows and he's on his knees in a humble way. He symbolizes the very highest expression of Luke's Christology of worship and thankfulness to God's Son. He shows him the greatest respect. This act of praise, of recognizing Jesus for who he is, the Son of God, also parallels our story from 2 Kings of Naaman's response to his flesh being restored. He too goes back to Elisha, if you remember, and he boldly announces, now I know there is no God on earth except the God in Israel. Basically, he was saying, Elisha, your God is the God of gods. Now, back in Luke, again, these stories parallel one another as a single leper whose eyes have truly been opened is a Samaritan. The other nine were Jews, only one Samaritan. If you notice in uh, Naaman's case, he was also a non-Jew. And Jesus is showing here in this text that the kingdom of God is open to everyone, to all people, not just to the Jews, but to everyone. And God's, uh, so that means God's work of salvation is going to go beyond his chosen people. Because he tells this man, who's a Samaritan, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Both our second Kings and gospel texts reveal that being able to see represents challenges for the believers today. Because what do you see in the world around us? What do you do when you do see something and what is your response? What is our reaction to God's presence around us? What do we see? Do, do we see Jesus when we look up into the clouds? Or are you paying attention to the role Christ is playing in your life? You see, it's real easy for us to go through life and only see our own concerns, our own issues, our own problems. And, and, and we do this in numerous ways. Sometimes we throw ourselves into our work. We ignore the world around us. All too often, we become blind to what else is happening, and we might even ignore our own spouse, we, or our family, or our co-worker, or even people we meet in public, because we're in our own little world. I think you know what that person looks like. Often you see somebody who doesn't want to make any eye contact with you, has their head down, or maybe they have their earbuds in and their sunglasses on. They want to just be in their own little world. You see, maybe Jesus is challenging us to see the world with his eyes. We live in a hurting world. It is surrounded by people with all sorts of health issues, work-related issues, difficult family situations. You name it, people are suffering these days. And I believe that Jesus is challenging us to get out of our safe zone, our, our bubble, if you will, and to really see people for who they are. But it's not enough to see them. What really matters is once we see them, what do we do about it? You see, when Jesus saw a need, he acted upon it immediately. And when the leper saw he was healed, he just did not celebrate his good fortune like the others and go to the priest to be declared clean. He returned to Jesus and he gave praise to God and he fell on his face before him. What he had was a life changing moment. Now, the art and chip Sansom's. Um, comic strip, The Born Loser. I, I've never really seen this, but apparently they had a comic about someone having trouble seeing. And a mother is uh, leaning over the back of her husband's chair, and the husband's sitting in the chair with his son on his lap. And the son asks his father a question. He says, uh, have you ever had a death, a near-death experience, Pop? To which the dad says, I can't say that I have, son. And then the mom who's leaning on the chair can't help herself but to say, the question is, has he ever even had a near-life experience? <laughs> in 
Now, you may not know what a near-life experience is, but that could be what many of us are having in our lives. Because a near-life experience is when a friend tells you that they're having a difficult time, and they have a difficult situation, and all you can think about is your shopping list and what you need to buy for dinner tonight. And you nod, and, but your mind is really elsewhere. Or let's say you're on a walk and, and you don't notice your surroundings because you're just so in tune to your own situation and your own issues. You see, the nine lepers who didn't come back to recognize and praise Jesus for the healing that they had received, they were having a near-life experience. They were only thinking of themselves. And they did not see the gravity of the situation and the hand of God that had been placed upon them. The leper who came back had a life-changing experience. He not only was healed, he was saved. His eyes were open to the world around him. He recognized the saving grace of Jesus Christ that was being poured out to him. His body, his mind, and his, whole, his spirit, his heart were undivided in giving God the glory and praise that he deserved. And Christ then not only healed him, but he saved him. And the question I want to leave with you is, have you had a life-changing experience recently? Are your eyes open to the world around you and to those who are hurting, who are in need? What do you see? Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. O oh God, our Father, your grace really does amaze us or at least it should. However, all too often we grow accustomed to your loving kindness, to your forgiveness, and your faithful provisions that you give for our needs. In doing so, we often lose sight of what our focus should be on. All too often we live from week to week. We are forgetful of where we would be without your grace. Oh Lord, we're thankful. We thank you for doing for us what we could never do for ourselves, and that is to forgive us of our sins and save us. Remind us of how much that forgiveness cost and how much that tells us about your relentless love and grace you pour out. Wake us to the sense, uh, to sense in a fresh way the security that comes from resting in the shelter of your hand. And these things we ask in all humility and gratitude. And, O oh God, may we open our minds to know new lessons, open our ears to hear new signs and sounds, Open our eyes to see new sights. Open our hearts to receive new relationships. Open our souls to your voice, to your guidance. Never let us stop learning, we pray, O oh Lord. And as we learn, help us to see adventure, to know change, and to find purpose as we grow in faith, that we might truly live. And may we have a life-changing experience, and not just once, but repeatedly, day in and day out. For you lead us each moment, O oh God. And if we could only remain open enough to hear and to see and to know as you would have us do. And even in the midst of darkness, we know, O oh Lord, that you can teach us. You can make us people who can learn in these great things that are great and small. Open our eyes truly, O oh Lord. And we come to you this morning lifting up our prayer chain of concerns. We we pray for Nancy Misogno, who's recovering from a, a stroke, and we pray that she can recover fully and able to walk and talk. We pray for Muriel Sim, who's going to be having a complete hip replacement on November 5th. And for Art Cruz, who's in Country View Manor, we pray for continued health for him. For Ruth Crawl, who's on oxygen and prayers for her fluid to uh, subside. And we pray for Clint Ryder, who is waiting to see where he'll get placed. And we pray for Jim Travail, who's finally got some answers back as to his pain and will have to have, a, uh, have his hip be uh, reconstructed and, and, and situated so it's in the right place. We pray for Mackenzie Ryder, and uh, we just pray for her and uh, that she can uh, keep her headaches under control. For Violet Byers as she battles cancer, as well as Ruth Jurens, uh, we also pray for Eliza Jansma, who is battling cancer. And for uh, prayers of joy, we, we give thanks for a newborn baby that Mallory had for uh, Kirsten Grace, and we pray that uh, she may be healthy and uh, 
Lord, we lift her up to you as, a, as truly a blessing uh, of the life that you help bring into this world. We also pray for those families who have lost loved ones recently, and especially for the family of Gary Pomerinke, as well as uh, Lois Loritz and her family. And Lord, we also pray for peace in this world. That as God's, that as people of God, we as a nation might be unified in our efforts to lift up your name and to give you glory and honor. For into your hands, O Lord, we, we place all of our needs, knowing that, that you are the one who with all authority and power and grace and mercy is able to do your will and turn any of our unbelief into trust. Open our eyes, we pray, O Lord. And as we pray, we ask now that we would pray that prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread our debts as we forgive our debtors and deliver us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen at this time we will have the sacrament of baptism and invite uh, jacob and maggie to come forward as well as uh the elders of uh, Brian and Sonia, and then I would also invite any children that would like to come forward and get just a closer seat uh, for this baptism. So any children that would like to come forward can do so at this time. I'm looking for children. I'm not seeing any. Okay. Come on up. <laughs> Here comes a couple. I got one. One's coming. Come some more. Tobias is not happy. All right. Let me begin with these words. That all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus said. So go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of age. And obeying the word of our Lord Jesus Christ, and confident of the promises, we baptize them to whom God has called. For in baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. And God frees us from sin and death and unites us with Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. And by water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of Christ's body. And we are joined to Christ's ministry of love and peace and justice. Let us remember with joy our own baptisms, then as we celebrate this sacrament. On behalf of the session, I present this child, son of Maggie and Jake Gish, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Do you wish to have your son baptized in Jesus' name? And relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your son? Do. Okay, to the congregation. Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized. Do we, the covenant partners of the church, promise to tell this new disciple the good news of the gospel, to help him know that all that Christ commands, and by our fellowship to strengthen his family ties with the household of God. And three, baptism. through baptism, we enter the covenant that God has established. And within that covenant, God gives us new life, guards us from evil, and nurtures us in love. In embracing that covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning from evil and turning to Jesus Christ. And as God has embraced you within that covenant, I ask you now to reject sin, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. Hear now these questions. Do you, trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? I do. And do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I do. And will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? I will with God's help. And with the whole church, I'd ask that we would stand together and say the Apostles' Creed. The words will be on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. We give you thanks, eternal God, for you nourish and sustain all living things by the gift of water. For in the beginning of time, your spirit moved over the watery chaos, calling forth order and life. In the time of Noah, you destroyed evil by the waters of the flood, giving righteousness a new beginning. And you led Israel out of slavery through the waters of the sea and into the freedom of the promised land. And in the waters of Jordan, Jesus was baptized by John and anointed with your spirit. And by the baptism of his death and resurrection, Christ has set us free from sin and death and opened the way to eternal life. We now thank you, O God, for the water of baptism. In it we are buried with Christ in his death, and from it we are raised to share in the resurrection. And through it we are born by the power of your Holy Spirit. Send your Spirit now to move over this water, that it may be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. Wash away this child's sin and allow him to be cleansed by it. Raise him to new life and graft him into the body of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon him, that he may have the power to do your will and to continue forever in the risen life of Christ. Amen. What is the given name of this child? Okay. Tobias Gerard Gish. I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Defend, O Lord, your servant Tobias with your heavenly grace, that he may continue yours forever and ever, and daily come, increasing your Holy Spirit more and more, until he comes into your everlasting kingdom. Amen. Let us uh, now turn in your hymnals to number 71, Behold What Manner of Love. See what love the Father has given to us that we should be called the sons of God. Let us pray. Ever living God, in your mercy you promise to be not only our God, but also the God of our children. We thank you now for receiving Tobias by baptism. Keep him always in your love. Guide him as he grows in faith. Protect him from all the dangers and temptations of life, and give the parents wisdom and patience to guide this child in the faith of the church, and bring Tobias to confess Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, and to be his faithful disciple to life's end. Amen. Let's see, we have a couple of things here for you. I'm going to use the cloth. Have his baptismal cloth with his initials. Your baptismal certificate, his candle for the first baptism, and then a child's first Bible. Oh, you're welcome. All right. Blessings. Yep. Congratulations. Dad. Yeah. 
All right. And at this time, we're going to have Tyler and Joyce come up for the dedication that we're going to do. <laughs> you want to get, you can get on this side? Yeah, yeah you can get over here. Now, there's something right. We don't often do dedications, but there's something right and lovingly about being able to have a child be dedicated. Uh, in front of his coming back here to do it uh, in front of his family. And uh, so this is a special uh, event and time for, for them. From Psalm 127, says that children are a blessing from the Lord. It's exciting that whenever a new child enters a family, there's no greater moment than when the parents sense their child is a gift from God. Dedicating a child acknowledges God's sovereignty, not only over the child, but also his mom and dad. And parents represent, present their child before God and his people asking for grace and wisdom in carrying out their responsibilities. So Tyler and Joyce, by coming forward, do you hereby declare your desire to dedicate yourself and your child to Jesus Christ? From Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Deuteronomy chapter 6 gives us the ingredients for a godly home. Therefore, do you, Tyler and Joyce, promise to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might? We do. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Do you promise to learn God's word so that you will be, he will be in your heart? We do. Do you promise to teach God's word diligently to your children? I want to ask the grandparents and great-grandparents to stand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Proverbs 17.6 says, Grandchildren are a crown for the aged. Do you promise to fulfill your role as great-grandparents and grandparents? Now I'd like to, the rest of the family and friends of Ezra to stand. That's all of you in these pews right up here. <laughs> <laughs> a family is a place where principles are hammered and honed on the anvil of everyday living. The role of the extended family is to pro also to provide support and nurture of our children. Therefore, I ask all those gathered, will you do everything in your power to support both parents and their children in holding up godly values and principles? You may be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Tyler and Joyce have brought their family before you today. I pray first of all for them as parents. I pray that you will give them grace and wisdom to carry out their responsibilities and to help them be godly examples in their own homes. I pray that in their home would be a place where each lives for the other and we all live for you. I also pray for Ezra Ikyao today. We dedicate him to you. I pray that he would be raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and that he would be trained in the way that he should go. And I pray that one day they will trust, he will trust in you as their own personal Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Amen. Why don't you give him this first Bible? This is a first Bible for Ezra. And has a little evidence of a baptism on there. <laughs> a little Toby on there. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations, Joyce. Congratulations.
We will continue our worship with the giving then of our tithes and our offerings. For today, the offering will be for the general fund. The scripture is from 1 Peter 4.10, which says, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Let us pray. Most loving and gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we ask you to receive this offering which we dedicate to you for the needs of your church. And it is because of your grace and love that we are enabled to lay this offering before you. And grant that now and in all our giving, we may joyfully give with a heartfelt gratitude, acknowledging in all things your fatherly goodness that you have so graciously poured out onto us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And our closing hymn then is number 512, 512, My Savior's Love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene.
And now receive the benediction of our Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.